Well, good evening, gentlemen. It's good to be with you guys again as we start our second video in this series through the book of James and, and the focus of a call of a man, a call of a Christian man. So I'm coming to you from home this week. Uh, I got rained out at work, so I don't know what your guys' day-to-day life is looking like lately right now. It's sort of been nice to be home for a little bit of a change. My wife's been going crazy with being here by herself with the kids since I have to go work out of town pretty much all the time. But um, but it's good to be, be back and to be able to um, put out another one of these videos. Today we're going to be studying the first section of James that we're going to be covering. And it's going to be chapter 1, verse 1 through 12. Um, and actually, if we want to get into it right now, let's go ahead and just read it. And it goes on like this. And it says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Can it all joy, brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds? For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let the steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all, without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, and stable in all of his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation. Because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flowers falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Would you go ahead and join me in some prayer? God, we just thank you for this time to come together and just study your word. We thank you for who you are. For revealing yourself to us in this way and I pray that as we um, just seek your wisdom and seek your truth Lord that you would reveal yourself to us that we would be equipped to do what it is you called us to do that we would be ready and able to be able to speak the gospel to share love to promote your laws and your statutes to those around us Lord thank you for all that you're doing in Jesus name amen so I sort of briefed it last week of, of what this series was going to look like and um, sort of going to continue in this fashion of doing section by section, uh, sort of topical, maybe not so much topical, but a very brief um, ex exposition of these, these letters or this letter in particular. And uh, what, what I thought was pretty interesting is when we first pick up the book of James, the very first thing he says is, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now, I, I, I find this interesting because like, if we know who this James is, the author, and pretty much all the scholars agree that it is Jesus' half-brother. Uh, this is a guy who grew up around Jesus. We don't really know the time period of of how long after Jesus was born did that the rest of his brothers and sisters show up. But we do know he did have other brothers and sisters, as mentioned in the Gospels. But this James <clears throat> apparently has had interactions with Jesus. Um, he knows scripture. And actually, as we read through this book, we're going to notice that there's some parallels to the book of Proverbs, actually. The way he writes this letter is very much a... Do this, this happens. Do this, that happens. And that's sort of the wisdom literature that you see in the book of Proverbs. But it's interesting to think about all these things that he is going to end up seeing from that perspective of being Jesus' half-brother. I always thought that was interesting because I, I don't know if you guys have siblings or or any other um, or younger, older siblings, whatever it is. But just thinking about that dynamic within that household, right? I mean siblings don't typically uh, get to see eye to eye all the time. And I could only imagine what it'd be like as having Jesus as your older brother who, 
who could do no wrong, literally probably could do no wrong. And, and every time you thought you caught him on something, it just wasn't so. And <clears throat> maybe growing up with this, maybe some sort of complex of, of, of being in, like in an inferior role. And we even sort of see a little bit of that in the gospels where, where his mother and Jesus' mother and brothers and family show up to, to talk to Jesus in this crowded scene. And, and they, they let Jesus know that they're here to talk to him. And Jesus is like, well, who are my mother? Who are my brothers? And it's those that, that do the will of my father. And, and so you, you sort of got to think through, through the, the, the humanity side of what was going on in James' mind. Now, obviously, later after the ascension of Christ, James actually rises up as one of the pillars of the Jerusalem church. Uh, in fact, a pillar is what he's referred to. Um, I, I believe in the book of Ephesians, Paul refers to him as a pillar. And then in the book of Acts, you see it a couple times when there's sort of this discussion that arises or sort of maybe a, a, a debate or a dispute over what should happen, whether they should take the gospel of the Gentiles or not. And James is actually the one that stands up and says, no, 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 this is, this is what needs to happen. So James, through whatever transition that had happened from, from him sort of pushing Jesus away to the, the, the resurrection and the ascension, now becoming this pillar, we get to this point in, in history where he starts to pen this letter, and it says to the 12 tribes in the dispersion greetings. So obviously what had happened is, is from the persecution of the church and, and, and that we follow in the book of Acts, uh, the, the, the tribes are, are getting scattered. Those that have claimed Christ as their Savior, they're now getting pushed out and, and they're sort of dispersing um, from that central hub in Jerusalem. Uh, I think it's interesting to, to think about how James is now viewing all that Christ went through and then now what his life is like now, what, what he is now going through. And, and later, James will become uh, one of the martyrs for the faith. He will be killed for his belief in his faith in Jesus. Um, this book is, is written probably, it's one of the earlier books written in the New Testament. Some think around 40 to 50 AD. And so if we put Jesus' death around 30 AD, we, we can see that it's, it's relatively quick after uh, Jesus ascends that, that this letter gets written. Um, but I do want to take some time to think about uh, what, what that means in, in that transition of being that follower of Christ. Now for James, I would imagine that would be a pretty hard transition, a pretty hard thing to overcome. The, this idea that, that somebody that was your own flesh and blood has some sort of authority over you. Uh, sometimes as, as men in, in the workplace or even in the academic place, we struggle with that. We struggle with this idea that somebody can have an authority over us. You know, I think pride oftentimes rises up within us and, 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 and it's always there creeping at our door to where we get this attitude of like, oh, you know, you're not going to tell me what to do. But yet we see the attitude of James. He, he labels himself as a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see that he's made this transition. He acknowledges his, his position to God. And I would encourage us as we, as we read through and as we go about our daily lives to realize our position with God. And then secondly, our position with our fellow men. You see, if God has shown us so much grace and has shown us a, a certain amount of, of humility through his son, then, then I think what the natural uh, repercussion of that inter exchange is, is likeness towards other men, towards other people, towards those around us. So we're actually going to take a little bit of a, a pause there. Um, we're going to... Uh, this is actually what was going to be one video, but I think I'm going to split it up so that way it's not too too much to handle at that uh, in these long increments. So um, this week I encourage us to um, seek out how we can be that servant.
how we can establish ourselves as um, that in that rightful rightful position before God. Um, how James learned to do. James was was somebody who could have easily sort of asserted his right as a brother of Jesus. I mean, nobody else nobody else can say that. And James could have easily done that, but what we see through Scripture and what we see in his personality and in his life lived out is that he he was that. He was that servant. So I encourage you guys, seek that out. Um, spend some time in prayer. I hope that we're, we're setting those reminders for ourselves to to either get into the Word or or um, <clears throat> to to set a, set a time apart for, for prayer or spending, you know, as, as long as we can, maybe growing those times. Maybe it's five minutes the first day, and, and by the end, next week we're up to 10 or 15 minutes. Whatever it is, I encourage you guys to to keep um, pushing forward, keep keep going forward in that. Next week we're going to dive into the rest of this this section. Um, it's, it's, there's just a lot of material there to cover, and I just want to make sure that we, we, we do this right. So anyway, have a blessed week, and, and I, I hope to see you guys back next time.